Hi, I'm Gary Weir from Australia, and I'd like to share some reflections on Ladakh, um, all part and parcel of a long walk in the Himalaya, which I completed in, uh, in 2003. Um, I thank also being invited to be to present this on behalf of the uh, IMF webinar series. My background has been very much in the Indian Himalaya. I've been organising leading tricks there for the last 47 odd years or so. Um, I author, I'm also the author of The Lonely Planet Trekking in the Indian Himalaya, um, Long Walk in the Himalaya, which was on the, based on the walk I undertook in 2003. And my latest is a um, historical narrative, Kashmir, A Journey Through History. Long walk in the Himalaya, um, essentially a five month trek from the source of the Ganges to Kashmir. Uh, I want to fo focus on the Ladakh section, but to give you a bit of context, um, I started off from uh, Gangotri and took about six and a half weeks to get across to Manali. I just share a few images to begin with. First of all, of going up to Utakashi. Uh, then going up to Gangotri and then going up towards uh, Gamuk and the source of the Ganges. It was a great way to start my trek. After that, I doubled back to Utakashi and from there went over the Dara Pass uh, around to the Yamanotri Temple and um, my, first, uh, my first wonderful campsite, looking right the way across the, uh, the ridges looking towards the um, far side of the Garbo. Um, the Yamanotri Pass was also a bit of a tricky pass. Um, had to get our ropes out, uh, look after the porters and their descent. Um, and then anyway, we continued over a series of 5,000 metre passes, um, right the way through Kinnor onto Spiti. Here we have the, the village of Mud. Um, and then over the Pimpabati Pass, which is going across the axis of the, of the Great Himalaya. You can really feel as if you're in the midst of the Himalaya in this particular stage of the trek. And then from there, down through the green verdant valleys of the Pimpavati Valley, uh, and then across into Manali to begin the second part of, our, uh, of the trek. Um, this part, a stage of the trip, which went from mid-July um, to the end of August, presented all number of highlights, um, some of which I want to uh, now go over. Um, first of all, we left, um, we, we left that by Manali going over the hump to pass. Um, we said goodbye to the, uh, to the verdant valleys, flowered meadows, and all of a sudden we came into the stark countryside of the Trans Himalaya, going over the Fitzila. And my first impressions, my first impressions after, oh, three or four years of traveling in this area, trekking in this area, was looking down a bird's eye view in the upper Zanskar Valley. So much has changed here. The, uh, the highest village out of Kargyak, which I've trekked through many times, certainly this is changing. Um, just in the last year and a half, a road is now connected, Kargyak, uh, linking over from Darcha in Himachal Pradesh, over the Shingala, and coming right the way down to the Zanskar Valley. That will certainly change the sort of cultural landscape. Um, and will give full number of trekkers a bit to think about, because um, there's always been the thing that remote uh, Trekkers wanted to visit remote villages, but remote villages wanted roads. Um, we continue on down um, through to Fukdol Monastery, um, again one of the oldest monasteries in the Zanskar, the original, um, the original cave there, which was used for meditation from about the 11th century onwards. But one thing that's changing here, and I noticed it on my trek in 2003, is that the, the monks were concerned. They're really having to get their act together because the, um, to broaden their curriculum. With the introduction since 1947 of um, government schools and also a number of private schools coming in as well, 
all of a sudden they've had to introduce English and science, um, for instance, into their curriculum. And I do remember one of the old monks turning around to me at one of the other monasteries there and saying, well, mm, we've been here for 900 years. Um, we're just going to have to sort of work through. We're certainly going to be here for a few more years to come. Going down into the Zanskar, one thing that I've been personally involved in is uh, revitalizing interest uh, with training workshops for the traditional uh, medical practitioners, the Amchi, uh, and in particular focusing on the female Amchi um, with the Australian Himalayan Foundation. Um, when we're there, when we're in the Zanskar though, we look north and you can see in the shadowed area there, that's the head of the Zanskar Gorge. And again, the people in Zanskar are going to have some remarkable changes in the next few years or so, when the road up the Zanskar Gorges is completed. All of a sudden, Padam, Kasha, the rest of Zanskar will be, have easy access into Leh. They're about to drive bypassing Kargil. They should be able to drive to Nimu and to Leh in something like sort of five or six hours. That is certainly going to change their cultural horizons. Um, just one image going down memory lane. The first time I led a, um, a rafting trip, trip down the Zanskar River is one of the more serene sections. And you can see the size, the magnitude of these gorges. And it is truly an engineering feat that they've been able to build roads up this, um, up this particular terrain. That said, there are ways that we can devise treks to avoid the main part of the gorges. Um, one being to go over a pass here called the Chachala, again, just around 5,000 meters. And then going into a series of gorges which lead into some of the remotest access areas in, in, um, in, in Ladakh. Um, only accessible for a few months each year and the more remote campsites as well, um, you begin to appreciate uh, this wonderful wilderness area. Uh, there's no shortage of barrel, um, the uh, Himalayan blue sheep, and you know where you see barrel, the, um, the snow leopard isn't going to be so far away. Um, we also caught sight of the Marco Polo sheep, the largest sheep in the world. So this whole wilderness area has got so many possibilities. And when we finally left after six days of not seeing a living soul, we made our way over the Zalon Kapola and made our way down to the Marka Valley. Um, this was um, a bit of a revelation because again, roads have been built up the Marka Valley and within a few years it will reach Marka Village. And so I think it's essential when we're looking at um, for possibilities for future generations of trekkers that we look towards some of the national park policies, both in Ladakh and in India. Because as I've said many times in public addresses, um, I certainly believe that within a few generations, trekking in the Himalaya will be very much like Europe, uh, like England, um, like America, Australia, it's going to be confined uh, to the proximity of the national parks. And one opportunity here is to extend the, the Hemus National Park from the Indus Valley, it, at the moment it extends to the Marga Valley, but to have it extend all the way down to the margins of the Zanskar, um, the Zanskar Valley, which again will give some wonderful trekking opportunities in the future. Obviously, wonderful opportunities also for the preservation of wildlife in the area. Anyway, hit the, um, the Indus Valley, you can see Tixi Monastery, and then the day after that, I walked into Ley for a few days, R&R, &R, before making the final section of my trek, which was to go across from Ley to Sirinagar, the capital of, um, of Kashmir. And here again, um, going through the sections of Ladakh was a real eye-opener, walking up to begin with up to Rumbak 
village where you can see the uh, solar panels, panels um, vying for attention with the prayer flags. The solar panels have been there very much because of the, the great work of the Ladakh Ecological Center. They were introduced um, into the more remote villages in the, in the middle of the 1980s. Um, and have certainly contributed towards the well-being of the uh, of the Ladakhi people. And of course, you've got the the homestays as well, where people can certainly sample something of the traditional lifestyle of the um, of the Ladakhi villages. Rumbak in the winter, though, um, presents other opportunities. Um, in the last sort of 10, 15 years, wildlife tourism has certainly kept caught on. Um, looking up the valley here, looking for the elusive snow leopard. Um, and for those who um, are fortunate to get a, a, a glimpse of the, um, of, the, uh, of the snow leopard, again, this is well worth rewarding if you can endure the cold temperatures of Ladakh in the winter time. Continuing through though, and going through these, um, going along these ancient trails, the more you begin to realize that there's been pilgrims, there's been armies, there's been traders making their way up these trails and over these passes for something like the last two and a half thousand years. You really get a sense of history as you're walking through Ladakh. Going over the Gandala, um, just a smidgen under 5,000 meters, you can see the rugged ridges of the Zanskar range um, to the south, and then you can see the snow capped ridges of the main Himalaya range. Just wonderful, wonderful trekking opportunities. You can also, and this is where the powers of irrigation, which was first introduced to the Ladakh about 2,000 years ago, so that people could actually settle and tend to, the, to their fields. Um, it is so dependent on, um, on a good supply of water from unseen glaciers and snow fields. And this is one of the big challenges of coming through Ladakh nowadays is that the effects of climate change is making uh, some impact. Uh, um, I mentioned earlier on about the Shingo La. Well, um, the only reason why they were able to build a road over the Shingo La and the Zanskar is because um, the glacier there has literally melted over the last 30, 40 years. And here again, in these remote areas, they're very much dependent on a good supply of water. This needs to be redressed. Continue on to the uh, ancient monastery, very famous monastery of, of, of Lama Yuru, uh, and then going over the Kanji La, 5,300 meters. Um, ah, it's just a wonderful area for trekking, coming down to the, uh, to the Rongbok um, Monastery. And when you get to the Rongbok Monastery, um, I do remember when I first trekked in um, in Ladakh in the 1970s. This was the uh, this was the area that was famed for the uh, for the Himalayan brown bear that had migrated over the Great Himalaya into Ladakh. Um, and in the last decade or so, there's evidence that the brown bear has. Um, Gone um, has headed um, has headed north to some of the other more remote villages. Um, you continue on down to the Sarul Valley, um, where you can get a glimpse of the twin peaks of Nun and Kun at uh, just over seven thousand meters. It's quite remarkable uh, when Frederick Drew, a geologist in the employ of uh, Rambia Singh, the second Maharaja of Kashmir wrote in the 1870s that uh, from the summit of these peaks, if you went all the way southwards to the Indian Peninsula, it would be essentially amongst Hindu villages. If you go eastwards across uh, Ladakh and Tibet, it's essentially, the high culture is essentially Buddhist. And if you go westwards, well, you've got the Islamic communities going right the way through Bortistan and Kashmir. So it really is literally uh, a place where three cultural worlds meet. Um, when we were walking down the, um, the Suru Valley, we had to divert uh, and go over the Umbala, 
again, it was getting towards winter, it was getting frightfully cold, really cold indeed. And uh, we were quite happy to uh, send the pass and drop down to Dras and make our way around to the Zoljilar. On my trek, on my five month trek, I did my very level best to avoid roads whenever possible. And even with the Zoljilar, looking down to the Alpine reaches of Kashmir, was able to bypass the road and certainly appreciate something of the, um, something of complete change of contrast. Um, there is so much to talk about Ladakh, and of course I'd love to talk also sometime about the trekking possibilities still in Kashmir. Um, I refer back again to my long walk in the Himalaya. Um, hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you so much for listening to the IMF, one of the IMF webinar series.